struggling is a choice. Being happy is a choice. Being unhappy is a choice. And just being aware is also a choice. And so it's just a matter of, as you say, that mindset, you know, are you just simply going to accept where you are right now? And if this is not the place that you want to be, then you've got all these tools and resources that you already possess that that you can really tap into. And the challenge that I find, <clears throat> quite frankly, is this, is that for most people, they just don't know what they don't know. And that's also the purpose of this platform as well, is really to have these conversations, real conversations, like the conversation with you today, and, and Wendy, if she's gonna share anything, <clears throat> um, <laughs> we're supposed to talk, by the way, um, then, it's, then it's great. Because we get to hear you know, what the real experiences are from other people, rather than just trying to translate, you know, the complex permutations of words in, in a book or whatever, but really listening to you and discovering, you know what, I can do that. You've done that. I can do that. And these are real stories. Absolutely. And I've had, a, like, I had a client who's, you know, again, he's very senior executive at a $500 million company. And, you know, I measured a couple of the core values. I said, what's most important to you at work? And he'd tell me, and what second most was third most. I said, so if you had to score all those on a one to 10, like, where are you now? And he came out at about a four, which, you know, for his level in a company, that's either ready to leave or possibly get fired. Because if you're, if that's your ever level of satisfaction and your most important values, you're not going to stay in a company or you're sure not going to do your best work. But by just being made aware of those, and then with each one, I asked him, what would it take for you to get this one from a four to a nine or a 10? And then we noted it and wrote it down. And then the second one, what would it take you to get from that? Okay. And then and then so and then what and then with each one of those, we broke down what are the interim steps. Well, now three months later, he's at a 10 on three of the four and a nine on the fourth one. And and it's tr totally turned around how he feels about about what he's doing. Um, the feedback has been remarkable. And um, you know, but it's if you don't start to at least get that level of self-awareness of what's of what's moving you toward what you want and what's not. Like so many people now, I, I live in San Francisco and I won't get into politics, but we're a very heavily democratic town. So, I mean, the, this whole election and results, I mean, people are running around with their hair on fire like the world's going to end. And it's probably not going to end. I could be wrong, but, it, and, but it's just, again, the, the collective mindset. So if you're spending time, a bunch of time with peers who are telling you the world's going to end, that's probably not going to be nourishing for you. It's probably going to be draining. Mm -hmm. Or I, I, I had another good friend and member of our mastermind that lives in Brazil. And you think things are screwy here. You know, I mean, they fired their first president. The second one's under indictment. You know, the, the dollar there has lost like two thirds of its value. So if you had a thousand dollars in the bank, it's worth, you know, three or four now. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, I mean, it's worth 30% of that. And so the whole collective mindset of a country was negative. So, you know, I, I, pur I purposefully restrict my access to the news because most of it's intentionally negative because huge secret, in case you didn't notice, the biggest advertisers are drug companies for depression and anxiety and other health conditions. So, you know, and real scary news gets people's attention. You know, real rosy, hey, we saved this puppy out of a gutter. You know, they may throw you one of those stories as a bone at the end of the night, but just sit, you know, sit through if you can hold good space an hour of the news and just rank every story as either negative or positive. And I guarantee you 98% of it's going to be negative. But it and, also comes back to the reason it's so negative. It also comes back to, you know, the the biology that we have, as you said, you know, we're always watching out for danger. And so that gets grabs our attention much more quickly than a, than a happy story. And so I, yeah. I totally totally agree with you um, on that. But also just to kind of put things in perspective, because it's very easy to lose that lose it, and not so much to make it an argument to make us feel good. But the truth is, a homeless guy who lives under a, a cardboard uh, a box or roof is far better than perhaps you know five billion people in the rest of the world. Because when you add the numbers up as well, I think it's what, two and a half billion people, we're almost at eight billion, by the way, um, 2.5 billion people are earning less than $2 a day. And then, um, and if you take the, the I think the, the uh, lower income of a Mexican, for example, five and a half billion people in this world 
earn less than that as well. And so, yeah, I mean, your hair may turn to get on fire, but the truth is, is that, you know, and again, it's, it's your mindset. It's a mindset of possibility. It's a mindset of openness. It's a mindset of making that choice of who you really want to be right now. And quite frankly, what you can offer and contribute to source, because if we're always complaining about what's wrong with our life, what else are we not doing? We're not seeing what's right about it. What a, what a, what other, what my, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I- is, is, you know, you're talking about in the workplace, you're trying to avoid the people who are very negative. How do you become a more positive influence on them to get their head out of the gutter? Because a lot of times there you'll work in a place and everybody's wonderful, but there's always that one person that you do everything to not work with because nothing is ever good in their eyes. How do you help switch that person's uh, thinking so they're not such a horrible person to be around? Well, first, you know, you can only help people change that want to change in general. <clears throat> so that person has to have a desire. But secondly, you know, the, one of the first steps in communication is to is to pace somebody. If you come up to a really negative, grumpy person and you're all bubbly and it's like, hi, Mark, how are you today? What's going on? It's great to see you. They're going to look at you and go Ugh, like that. It's like it's like that's going to be like the, it's because it's just there's too big of a gap between where they are and where you are. So you have to bring yourself down. One of my first investors was this kindly old Japanese man who was actually, I found later, interred, unfortunately, in one of our own camps during World War II. He was an American citizen, second generation. But I mean, the Japanese culture and people, especially that age, is quiet and it's refined. And when I first came at him as my energetic self, he's just looking at me like he doesn't get it. And over a course of time, and I didn't have all these tools then, I said, oh, God, if I match his voice, if I can speak at his level, so for that kind of sad person, you don't want to go be sad with them, but you can kind of drop your tone down to about their tone or their speed of voice to your speed of voice or even breathing. One of the greatest ways to match somebody, to pace them, is just notice how he's breathing. And if he's breathing really shallowly or she, and and or rest, just watch one of their breaths and start breathing with them. And you've created literally for what 99.99% of people will be an unconscious level of rapport that will make him hate, feel like, hey, I'm not alone. I'm not the only person that's breathing this shallow pace breath. Uh, the other thing you can do, um, and, and you want to pace a couple times before you start to lead anybody. Because, again, you know, if you just come at them like, hey, why are you so sad? You, you just can't really do that. So it's. You know, it's, most people don't really feel seen, heard, or understood. So if you really want to connect with that person, take them aside for coffee and and just open up saying, you know, hey, Todd, I, I mean, it, it seems like there's some stuff bothering you. Know, okay, how are you? You know, how, how, you know, how are things? Is there something I can do to help or support you? And often just, just spending five minutes of genuine con- eye contact, one-to-one contact, and truly great listening will at least lift some of the burden for people that are in that constant negative state. So those are those are a couple of tips that generally work. But you know, the if if you're surrounded with too many negative people rather than, you know, I would say go change companies and be around a company with more yeah. positive people. Especially if it's your boss. Because you're not gonna you're almost never gonna turn around a negative boss. And I've only had two in my life and it was awful and I'll never do it again. Well, she's got a pretty cool boss. So, uh, and I'm saying that because I own some money as well. Um, I, I love my job, and on, honestly, this is the first job I've had where there is no negative people. So I'm like, okay, I got my, I got my dream job. We're good. <laughs> yeah. You know what's true too is it's also about leadership, and you know what what qualifies a great leader, and this is something that escapes most people. But what really qualifies a great leader is someone who understands what people need and help them do things that they wouldn't otherwise do on their own. And so it is about leadership and that's a choice that you you can make. But remember one thing is that, you know, you're responsible for your own brain. You're, all, yeah. you're responsible for your own thoughts and therefore your own actions. And so, so are they, so is everyone else. And then you always have to ask yourself, and this is an important part because if you feel kind of uncomfortable about the way somebody else is behaving, you know, that's that's an opportunity to actually look inside of yourself first and say, hey, what's going on here? 
And that's why I came up with my own expression. I celebrate my faults and my weaknesses, really because now it comes into my awareness of, hey, why am I uncomfortable right now? What's going on with me? So that there's something that I can change. I mean, there's a reason why Gandhi said, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. You know, you yeah. be the change and just be the model of, of greatness. But, you know, uh, Mitchell is, is right on in, in so far as how we communicate. And that's one of the unfortunate things about our societies and education, by the way, is that we really don't learn how to communicate. And Mitchell knows as well is that, you know, 7% of the way we communicate is act, the actual words. The rest is our body language and our intonations. And so we can connect much more effectively you know, by matching the other people's uh, physiology and behavior and really connect with them. One of the big secrets is people, and this I think first came from either Dale Carnegie or uh, They Can Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, is like people like people who are like them. So if you want to get somebody to like you and it's not being manipulative, it's just, it's, it's basically just an easier access point, be more like them. I mean, if somebody's a loud talker, talk more loudly too, because if there's, the, within a certain band, you can be different, but if you're so different, it, it becomes kind of, it becomes harder to just even have that level of rapport. Um, so, you know, and, and when it comes to faults and weaknesses, you know, it, again, where that self-assessment comes in, and it's like, I mean, I don't know, I mean, I'm probably only 20% on my path of the other 80 that I still have to find and transform. It's a lifelong, I think I've changed over 400 limiting beliefs in my life since working in an LP 15 years ago. And I'm, I'm really excited about the next 500. And it's like welcoming all the yeah. visitors to an exploration. Like I, I still don't love confrontation. I don't know many people that do. My, my cousin does, he said, you know, so he found exactly the right career for that. He's a litigator. So, I mean, he does it for a living, but I still think confrontation and conflict is not great, but we all have to basically tell truth to others sometimes. And yesterday I had to do that with, someone who I considered a dear friend, a business associate about something that just was really out of, out of alignment for me. And, and so I, to do that, I got in my most heart state and kind of first started saying with, you know, there's something that's triggering me here and I'm curious about it. And I know there's some, there's a part of this that is all about me and that I will need to learn more about, but there's also something in what you're doing that is triggering that. And I want to make sure you're aware of it. And it was a totally different way to have a confrontational conversation with somebody who, you know, it, uh, several people in my group just said, oh, just write that person off. Oh, you know, they're a bad person, don't do it. And, and yet through that hour or so experience we went through, I learned a lot more about myself. I learned I've got some programs and some rules around things, around loyalty is a really huge value to me. And I felt this person had not been loyal. And so there's a level to respond to that, but if you're responding so much that it's kind of almost an unconscious or triggered response, then you're not acting in a conscious present way. You're kind of reacting to these programs that fortunately and unfortunately, good programs help support our highest values and our best self. And some of these limiting programs, you know, keep us from being our best self. And like with all of my clients, I typically will have a strategy part of every session and then we'll have some identification of at least one belief area or one area where you're getting triggered in your life where let's transform that so that no longer happens. So rather than, than, than kind of mentally overcome it in the future, it just doesn't trigger you anymore. You know, my, my wonderful wife, who I've been with for 21 years, the end of this month, you know, she was always late for social stuff, always. She'll probably get mad if she sees this. But, you know, and, and, and I used to bother me. And, and where was that original program? My dad said that being on time was the most important thing in the world. And if you aren't on time, you're, you're devaluing the other person. You're telling them that your time is more valuable than theirs. And so I worked on shifting that program. And instead of it being a negative, I bought a guitar and literally taught myself how to play guitar, waiting for my wife to get ready for us to go out. Perfect. You know, I'm not a great guitar. I'm not a great guitar player, but at least I can accompany myself on some songs now. So it's like, so now when she's late, it's like, oh great, what three songs do I want to work on now? That is awesome. <laughs> or, or you can start serenading her and just uh, having her come uh, and listen more quickly and then be able to go wherever you no, need to go. No, when she's 
he's in ready mode, you don't want to you don't want to go into the field. It's the field of readiness. So you just you know, you know, one of the other secrets of happy marriage that I learned from somebody is separate bathrooms. His bathroom, her bathroom. Woman mm -hmm. goes into her zone, does her thing. She looks fantastic. She's amazing. You've seen her, um, and she's just an amazing person. So again, that really was probably the, one of the biggest things we used to fight about in the early part of our marriage, and now it's just not an issue. And also with all my friends, I pre-fame like, hey, you know, we're going to be on, you know, on our on on social time. Like there is a difference. There is a window that's okay to be late in social time. And even beyond that, if you're late and it's social, you know, whatever, it's not like a business appointment. I really think you shouldn't screw around with my, my strategy for business appointments is to be 15 to 30 minutes early. And now that we live in an age where, you know, my whole computer and all my work and my life is on here. Great. I can catch up on three texts or I can read something or I can research something, or I can think a little bit more about the person who I'm having the meeting coming up and read their LinkedIn and think more about their interests and how, how am I going to build a deeper relationship or connection with them? You know, and it really just simply comes down to this, you know, what's your model of the world? And, and perhaps people listening in may not be familiar with this concept, but, you know, we all have our model of the world. We all have the rules and regulations of what's right, what's wrong, you know, what they believe, what they value and everything else. And so that's different for everyone. And just because someone disagrees and, uh, you know, with one kind of behavior doesn't mean that they're wrong. And this is something that I was very fortunate to to appreciate very early on in in my uh, life, because I grew up in five different countries, and yeah. I immediately exposed to the fact that in one place what was absolutely correct and, and appropriate and proper was completely the opposite in the other, and they were both right. And so, <laughs> what's interesting then, and this is just so wonderful, and, and all this personal growth that we get to have because. You know, you said something that was, you know, very important for people to appreciate. You said, look, I had all these 400 problems that I've now resolved. You know, for us to to get divine happiness, and I believe that all of us desire divine happiness, we have to resolve whatever makes us unhappy. And if you're completely unaware of those things, you can't do anything about them. So I'm excited for you for your next 500 because that just means that you're going to get even more closer to your divine happiness. But the problem that so many people have, I believe, is judgments. And as soon yeah. as you judge something, you lose the entire opportunity to appreciate the greatness of what your judging is. And 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 you disqualify disqualify the possibility of learning something in that moment. And I'll give people some grace with that because judgment is almost by definition, it's the only way we could 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 be conscious beings. I mean, to completely be eliminated, I mean, Jesus had judgment. Gandhi had judgment. I mean, they just they just weren't doing it most of the time. Um, you know, so because we nominalize, so much information is coming to us, we, nom we have to filter things down and our, our conscious mind has to make decisions about things. Now, you can certainly on the ones that you don't like, and again, part of this whole model of the world is, if you're living by a set of values and rules, don't you at least want to know what the heck they are? Right. And, and, and you know, and the best book for this, and, you know, I, I, people love them, people hate them, but Tony Robbins's, you know, Unleash the Power Within, one right. of the chapters has you discover what are your values and what are your rules. And your values are things you value the highest, like love, but then your rule is, I, I feel loved when my wife makes me dinner every night. You know, well, my wife's not going to make me dinner every night, so I better change that rule. Because yep. my wife works and she's has a full time career and she has friends and outside stuff and we also live in the best restaurant city in the world. So everybody should try to figure out is what they're what they value the most and what are the rules that are allowing them. How how easy is it for you to you know feel or experience like even happy is a really triggering word for a lot of people. It's like this elusive thing that you know when I have this much money and when I have this car and a wife that's this good looking or husband and these three kids and the job of my dreams, then I'll be happy. Like happiness is like, it's, I, I prefer one of my other mentors who says just like string together moments of joy, like pearls. Because anybody, everybody's experienced moments of joy. Not many people, you know, know whether they've ever truly been happy for as a sustained thing. But, you know, right now, every time you and I are together, it's, it's a moment of joy. So, you know, I've, I've, I've just strung another pearl together and boom, you know, I've got a, another call right after this with somebody else great 
boom, another moment of joy. I get to reconnect with your lovely, wonderful producer and she was on that sign. Boom, another moment of joy. I'm just looking out right here and seeing San Francisco Bay and the sailboats out there. It's kind of a windy day, but there's a couple. That's another moment of joy. So if you make it easier to break it down, because I, I think I think happiness is kind of a nebulous thing, but it, like and then one of the NLP strategies is to chunk really big things down. How can I experience more moments of joy today than I did yesterday? How can I experience moment? Well, I experience more moments of joy watching CNN from six to eight o'clock tonight, or will I have more moments of joy going for a walk with my dog and then listening to some amazing music and having a great conversation with my wife? Which one of those two options are going to likely deliver me more moments of joy? So I yeah, like well, that. I, yeah, and, and you're spot on with that. And you know, sometimes the words we use is just about semantics and what we mean and our understanding of that. <clears throat> and that's also true as to what allows us to feel joy or not depending on language and meaning but one thing that's i think is brilliant about that value there's an there's an exercise that you can actually do and say say for example your top three values are let's say love health and and finance or wealth let's say and and then you can start playing around with the actual order and then have yeah. a completely different experience because if love health and uh, wealth were were the proper order what if I change it and said that wealth was first, you know, health uh, or love was second, and then health was third? You know, I might disregard my health at the expense of getting wealthy, and also uh, compromise my health at the expense of love. And so, for people doing that kind of exercise, you know, and this is a, an exercise that Tony Robbins does in his amazing events, you know, he specifically has you ask the question. You know, what would a person do or what would a person believe if he had these values in this particular order? And it's a wonderful exercise because then you also get to appreciate, you know, what is it that you really want? Just like you said, you know, do I want, am I going to get more joy watching CNN between six and eight? Or am I going to get more joy just going outside and enjoying nature? And the truth is, is that, you know, probably go out and, and, and enjoy nature because that is something that that provides and generates positive energy in the body that really enhances your health. Yeah, and there's there's lots of evidence to back that up. And it's just, uh, um, you know, it, it, especially if you can find wild nature, and I know that's harder for people in big cities, but um, nature that really hasn't been disturbed in any way or, or man-man created. But even, even a tree that was planted in a city is better than, uh, again, sitting on a, you know, a cement bench. Yeah, and worth comes to worth. I mean, I mean, it's not not exactly the best alternative, but, you know, the visuals on computers and screens and just yeah. experiencing that and just kind of, in a, in, a, in a sense, you know, kind of the things that you were describing earlier, just getting into that meditative state and just experiencing some of these images and just almost imagining yourself being in that because, you know, the brain doesn't really differentiate what's real, what's in your, what's, your, what's imagined. And so, you know, you still can have that. You're missing out a lot of the true energetic impulses that come from, you know, Mother Earth. But, you know, this is, this is the second best. But I do want to challenge you on one thing in, when it comes to judgment. And again, perhaps it's, it's uh, semantics. You know, I like the word today uh, of, of opinions. I have opinions of stuff rather yep. than judgments. And when I find that I have a judgment of something, then it's sort of like I'm not really giving that person a chance to, to express or allow me to appreciate or respect their model of the world. So it's just a matter of semantics, I think. Yep. But I think the real challenge is, is that you know, we are quick to assume something for all those programs and things that you were describing earlier. No, I agree. I agree with you on that, and it's uh, it was it was only the only reason I even brought it up was just because that is one of those words that's very triggering for people, and um, and I I know a lot of people that have tried to chase this idea of being judgment free, and you know I think it's one of those very elusive things because, yeah, and so it's just a matter of how you hold space for them. I mean, in a lot of ways, what you've just done is again another NLP thing of reframing even though a word like judgment to opinion. Right. I have an opinion about somebody. Now, what's that opinion based on? Is it based on a combination of past experience? Is it based on your beliefs? 
Is it based on other internal programs? Is it based on what you've heard, the noise around of, of the community around you? Is it based on what you've read on your Facebook feed? Um, or a combination of all those. So it's all a matter of, again, self-inquiry and being able to self-assess and self-calibrate often just what's going on. And anybody can practice it. One of the easiest practices to check in with yourself is even just to set your you know, your phone or your, if you've got one of those uh, tracker activity watches, you know, to set it every hour, you know, for like a, an on the hour check-in, like, how am I doing? How do I feel right now? If I had to rate my overall state of presence, focus, well-being, 10 being, you know, wow, unbelievable. I'm sitting here at Yosemite with my three best friends and it's a perfect day right at sunset and, you know, everything's just perfect. That's a 10. One is, you know, I wish I could hide under my covers in bed. Where are you? And sort of practicing some self-calibration and then just trying little things that could nudge that number up. And you'd be surprised how fast you can nudge that. The unconscious mind, with most of my clients, once I practice with them a bit, they'll, they'll say, well, where are you at your overall state? And they'll be like, well, I'm an eight right now. I said, okay, I'd like you to just close your eyes, breathe in a little bit, through the, in through the nose, out through the mouth, kind of drop inside yourself and just kind of ask your unconscious mind, what does it need to do to get you up to a 10? And your unconscious mind is so happy that you're talking to it that it, it's like, well, I sure, I'll be happy to help. And most of my clients within a minute, without me doing anything, I'm holding space for them. Okay, I'm a 10 now, let's go, let's have our session. Yeah, because what's true about that? You can achieve a lot more at level 10 than at level eight, let alone at level four. Well, and you can not just achieve, but you can hold much more challenging things with a, with a lesser likelihood of it dropping you down into into a into a much lower or much or negativity or more judgment or more other things so and great thanks so uh, apart you know your you know your um listeners more than i are, are there any other things you think are would be really important for them just as they as they focus in their uh careers or lives that i well, could share my most important listener and and dear friend is is wendy so um, what do you think wendy <laughs> Give us your thoughts, your feedback, or questions that you think people might want to know. Oh, my gosh. You know, you're putting me on the spot there. I love it. <laughs> um, as as an individual, let's say you are, um, you you need to motivate yourself better. How, how do you do that as a person? Just like, you know what? I am so not in a good mood. How do you talk yourself into just being a more positive and a 10 instead of an eight? Well, the easiest way to do that for most people is just to think of a time, imagine a time, I love that term, imagine a time when you were a 10 and close your eyes and and just see what you were seeing and hear what you're hearing and feel what you were feeling when you really felt like a 10 and just be there now, Wendy, and let me know when you're there. I like being a perfect 10. <laughs> We're good. I'm there. Did you, did, you, did you go somewhere though? Did you follow along? Oh yeah. Yeah. I was on the beach in Hawaii. Awesome. And, and when you're on the beach in Hawaii, it's, it's all great, right? Mm -hmm. It's relaxing. You come back present more to me and Bart. Are you still bringing all those good feelings with you? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, but of course, cause you've been around this more. For most people, that's almost when I first learned this 15 years ago, it was like magic to me that yeah. just that you can that you can bring a good state to you. And then once you stop thinking about it, you still bring much of it along with you as you go forward. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like taking a mini vacation without uh, without the expense or without uh, anybody harassing you for your visa. <laughs> so what, what, he, what he just did, basically, he allowed you to focus on a true experience that also has a tremendous anchor inside of you and, and nlp we use that term anchor you know just like when you go shopping and you suddenly smell you know uh, cookies that your grandmother made just inspires you to want to buy cookies you know marketing companies you know have figured that strategy out really well and this is really no different i mean you're you're tapping into a pattern or a program that you're used to that just makes you feel happy it doesn't matter why it is 
and and so that's what you know um, uh, uh, Mitchell was sharing with us earlier is what you focus on but then also your language if you want to change your 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 state if you will you know change the language change the words that you're telling yourself you know am I livid or am I angry or am I frustrated I mean completely yeah. different experiences I mean your f entire physiology is wired to respond to the language that we do and finally as Mitchell was shared earlier on is also your physiology you know, standing up the brilliant thing about having that timer every hour is to actually you know focus on where you're at but also take that opportunity I would add is to stand up walk around for a minute to get out of that chair and prevent the new disease that we have in this country which is called the sitting disease and that's mm -hmm. simply what people you know sit down for long periods of time six to eight hours and that includes driving that includes watching TV sitting down <clears throat> for for, for uh, meals and then working and that risk is actually much cardiovascular risk is much higher than smoking yeah so we have one minute left <clears throat> so for the last 30 seconds Mitchell what are any last uh, wise words you would like to share wise words are uh, spend as much time as you can in a positive joyful state and again the easiest way to do that is to imagine a time when and imagine yourself floating in that time, see what you're seeing, hear what you're hearing, feel what you're feeling, be there now, and wait, open your eyes feeling fresh and amazing and bringing that positivity with you out into the world. And, and uh, there's so much good and love out in the world. Just, uh, just be a part of it and share it. Love it. And how do people find you, Mitchell? Uh, they can find me at my house, which I'm not gonna give the address, but. Other than that, they can find me at uh, growthceoadvisors.com. Great. Hey, Mitchell, thank you so much. It's been a great privilege and honor for both Wendy and myself. <clears throat> we love these conversations, and I am Dr. Bart Rademick, a prescription for your transformation, tapping into your brain intelligence, your body intelligence, and your energy intelligence, bringing new voices, new solutions to you. And I thank you, and we will be back next week. <laughs>